I've been doing some brainstorming this week, and I would like to share some bad movie ideas with you. Oh, excellent. You know how I love musical biopics. This is a musical biopic of legendary African-American blues man, Mississippi John Hurt. The lead role to be played by white English actor John, John Hurt. Hurt. Yes. The thing is, I think he'd do a good job. Oh, he always does a good job. But that doesn't change the fact that it's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. This next idea is quite something. You know how when you go to movies, you want to see big stars? Yeah. This movie is called A-List. Every actor in the film is an A-List movie star. Even the extras. <laughs> so, we're in a coffee shop. George Clooney and Sandra Bullock are having an argument. Who's that eating a biscotti behind them? Is that Tom Cruise? Yeah. Is that barista Anne Hathaway? Yes. Do either of them have lines in this movie? No. A-list. Wasn't that the player? I'm going to take it even further. Oh, do it. The director of the film, the current sitting U.S. president. Whoever it is, when the Whoever it is. filmed. That's a terrible idea. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Here in The Basement in November, our theme is glaring omissions. What do you say, every episode is a glaring omission? Shh. Okay. After all these years, it's about time we've watched this. It's time to go to the Old West, Matt. I know, we've done Westerns before, but what about the other Old West? You know, the one that's filmed on authentic Spanish locations with poorly dubbed dialogue. I'm talking spaghetti Westerns. And as a bonus, one might call it a meatball on top of all that spaghetti. We have our old friend, Kinski. Don't expect a reply when you say buona fortuna, partner, to the Great Silence. Hmm. Never encountered <coughs> this title or dreamt, dreamt of it. Yeah. <laughs> Released in 1968 and directed by Sergio Corbucci, Il Grande Silencio is an international production starring Frenchman Jean-Louis Trontignon, German Klaus Kinski, and a whole lot of Italians. The lead character, the title, and the film were tailored to Trontignon's insistence that he would only do a Western if he didn't have to learn a line of dialogue. As is tradition, we have presents. Hey. hey! But it doesn't fit in the box, so oh. if you'll close your eyes. What's my present? I want my present. All right, here you go. Oh, my own hat. I'll be surprised if it fits you. Yeehaw! So hop on your horse and bundle up and head over to the big leather couch where we're going to watch The Great Silence. I really hope we see some good Kinski craziness in this. I hope in this one he wants two opera houses. A man on a horse crosses a snowy plain. That person is known only as Silence. There's a bunch of gunmen waiting for him. These guys are bounty killers. However, Silence wasn't born yesterday, and he gets the drop on these guys and takes them all out. He's one of the best gunslingers in the West. Warn me next time when you're going to shoot. There's a group of outlaws that are living in the mountains, and they come out and help Silence. They're just fighting for their rights, and he's sympathetic to their cause. Still, if we fought for our rights, they'd raise a price in our heads, and we'd be massacred. What do you think of that, Silence? Huh? I just gave you a lot of information. Okay, then. Uh, I'll talk to you later. I'll talk to you later. One of their numbers, though, decides he's going to go home and see his mama. Those bonnie killers are gonna get you, but he does it anyway. Silence rides through the snow. Silence he talks. No, no. Silence. <laughs> Watch out for Kinski. Kinski can't sneak up on silence. He'll be able to hear his eyelids flaring. <laughs> Luigi Pistilli. His specialty is knives. <laughs> The young man goes home and sees his mother. Look, this lawyer, he's going to review your case and he's going to get you a fair trial. But those aren't lawyers. They're bounty killers. They shoot the boy. Loco is one of the most notorious bounty killers in the land. The governor is appointing a new sheriff to Snow Hill. He wants him to go in and get rid of all these bounty killers because it's bad for the state. Silence rides into town and the grieving mama goes to him and says, Hey, you're the one who helps those who fight for their rights. Please, avenge my boy. Don't say no. Do what I implore of you. Okay. <laughs> Charlie, the killer, is in the local saloon eating some chicken. And not quietly, I might add. Yeah, I know. Man, does he eat chicken gross. I keep eating and eating. 
It's still I'm miserable. <laughs> Silence goes in there, and he provokes this guy into drawing his gun. Shut that damn door! Ah! Uh, oh, oh, I'm dying! You just shot. <laughs> Shall I arrest him? No. Charlie provoked him and drew first. Silence knows his way around the law. Loco pays a visit to Pauline. Her husband, James, also has a price on his head. If you care about your wife, come out! Come on out, Eagle Eye Cherry. Ah! She buries her husband and vows revenge. The sheriff is on his way to Snow Hill when he's ambushed by these hill people. They want his horse so they can eat him. Luckily, the sheriff runs across a stagecoach and he flags it down. On that stagecoach is Silence, the character, and also Silence the Condition because he doesn't talk. They're both going to the same destination, Snow Hill. I think I know why Silence doesn't talk. Because his voice sounds like this. <laughs> the stagecoach pulls into the Wells Fargo station to switch horses, and Loco's there. He loads his corpses onto the stage. Don't fall asleep, Sheriff. Silence will draw a dick on your face. <laughs> I'm Gideon Burnett, the new Sheriff of Snow Hill. Hey, me. I gathered from your star. I thought you sold horse meat. I give away horse meat, actually. <laughs> yep. I didn't know I could sell it. <laughs> Sheriff says that's against the law, and Loco says these men are outlaws, so I can do what I want, man. Those are dangerous men, Sheriff. The enemies of garden men. Of garden men? Gnomes, you mean? <laughs> they arrive at the town of Snow Hill. Hey, girls, the stage is here. We can huh? now put on that play. We've been working on it. Sealed Magnolias, here we come. Where they meet up with Henry Pollicut. He's a local businessman, and he seems to be kind of a shady character as well. Evil beard. Silence meets up with Pauline, who wants him to kill Loco. We find out why Silence is so silent. Now we know why Silence is always wearing turtlenecks in the summer. Yep. I hope you can read. <laughs> Silence writes a note saying that he'll do it for a thousand dollars. Pauline says, I'll get you the money tomorrow. Meanwhile, Polycut wants Loco to go kill Silence, because this is the guy who's killing all the bounty hunters. And that eats into Polycut's business, because he's also the banker of the town. I'm not sure how the whole thing works. Oh yeah, he gets a percentage of all the bounties that come in. Silence? He's too fast for me. I'm not stupid. Silence goes upstairs and he has a flashback about when he was killed, and a y <laughs> when he was killed. Oh, this is a flashback to Silence's youth. Back when he was called Talky Talk where we find out that a gang of bounty killers has murdered both of his parents. It's kind of like a Batman origin story thing. And Henry Pollicut was one of those men. We gotta kill this kid too. No, nope. I'll make it so the kid can't talk. And he pulls out a knife, and we know what happens next. He'll never talk again. Surely he won't develop a thirst for vengeance and <laughs> really good gun skills. Pauline goes to Pollicut. She says, I'll sell you my house for $1,000. Pollicut says, I'll give you the money. I don't want to take advantage of you. And meanwhile, he really wants to take advantage of her in ways that she finds unsavory. I didn't get the money, but I still want my revenge. Would you consider working pro bono? The sheriff and Silence, they hang out shooting potatoes together. It turns out they're both expert gunsmen. Gun, gunmen. Gun, they're, they can shoot potatoes like you wouldn't believe. Sorry, Silence. These potatoes died of natural causes. <laughs> Let's have it. He can't answer, Sheriff. He's a mute. A mutant. Loco's in the saloon. He's playing cards, and Silence shows up and tries to provoke him into a fight. I imagine every time Kinski looks at someone, a little bit of their soul dies. <laughs> Loco says, nope, I will not get into a gunfight with you. However, I'll get into a fist fight with you. I'm going to punch you a bunch of times. That's a punch bunch. Silence grabs a log, and he gives Loco quite the walloping. <laughs> Guys in the saloon draw their guns. <laughs> Loco is taken to jail. Turns out that Silence was injured in that gunfight. So Pauline administers to his wounds, and then they administer to each other. They make with the sweet kissing. They use the same chicken foley for kissing. <laughs> Boss! Silence is making love to Pauline. It's very slow and sensual. The sheriff says that he's going to take Loco down to the county seat so that there can be a proper trial. 
Well, this hero says that the dead man's brother and his friends are coming. But if you ask me, he's talking through his hat. Sheriff, listen to me. I'm, I'm telling the truth. Now you're talking through your hat. What? Me? Everyone kind of sounds the same through a hat. I, I really can't tell. <laughs> they meet up with this gang of outlaws. Uh-oh, looks like horse is on the menu again tonight. And the sheriff tells them, don't worry guys, amnesty is coming for you and you'll soon be able to go back to your homes. We're going to put out some supplies for you and you can have them if you'll just stop with the crimes already. The mountain people say, okay. On their way back, Loco tells the sheriff that he needs to make a poo-poo. Oh, all right. I wish Admiral Akbar were here to help the sheriff out and uh, inform <laughs> him of what's going on. Yeah. Loco gets the drop on him. I've heard of a bowel movement, but a rifle movement? <laughs> and he makes it so the sheriff falls through the ice of the lake. Loco jumps on his horse, rides off, and hooks up with his old gang. All of these outlaws are coming to this one place to get these supplies, and we can get the drop on them. They all got really tiny bounties, but added together, it'll be a lot of money. What do you say, guys? Since you murdered Sheriff Burnett, I don't go for that. No can do. I can't go for that. And while we're at it, we can kill the silence fella. Kill your brother. I told you, say no go. <laughs> the guys are like, all right. Polycut breaks in on Pauline in silence. He takes off his glove and he says, look at what you did to me. And then we get to see Polycott's flashback about when he met silence before. Silence shot off one of Polycut's thumbs. That's a little trick that he does. Now I'm gonna get my revenge on you. I'm gonna have my way with the lady. And hey, Mr. Goon, stick his hand in the fire. That's his shooting hand. So he only has his crappy left hand. Oh, and he can't even scream because he's too silent. But silence gets out of the grip of the goon. Log! He burns the goon's face and he shoots Pollockett dead. Ah! My face hurts. It needs some glass now. Regina, who's a good friend of Pauline. If I kill you, I'll be glad you're here. <laughs> That's why you hire Kinski. Yep. <laughs> Loco and his gang round up all the outlaws and force them into the bar. They're going to collect that bounty one way or the other. And they send word out. I want the mute to come shoot it out with me. Classic gunfight in the street. Or else he's going to kill everybody. Silence's hand is all burned up, but he's going to try and do it anyway. Pauline follows him. Silence gets to the place of the showdown, and one of Loco's men shoots his other hand. He's got no hands now. Well, it's all over but the shouting for Silence. Not that he's going to be doing any. Loco kills Silence. He dead. Pauline runs out, tries to get his gun. Loco kills Pauline. She dead. Loco kills all of the outlaws. They dead. In the next scene, Loco and his men murder Santa Claus. <laughs> Loco and his friends mount up. And they leave town because their job here is done. There is no happy ending in the great silence. <sighs> Nothing man can ever do will wipe out the blood stains of the poor folk who fell here. Ending of this movie was described as nihilistic. I had no idea how nihilistic that would be. The title, The Great Silence, does not refer to the main character. It refers to the absence of God. <laughs> The Italians are taking a page from Bergman in this one. This might be a reaction to World War II. This is what fascism does. This is what Stalin did and the Nazis did and Mussolini did. Interesting take on the whole invincible hero, mm -hmm. which shows up in Westerns all the time and still does. Yeah. And in this one, the hero is pretty invincible, but at the end he's brought so low. You don't see that very often. But they set it up as though it's going to be silence and the sheriff wiping out all the bad guys. But no. They even give the sheriff an ambiguous death. Usually the rule is if he doesn't die on screen, he's not dead. Yeah. You expect the sheriff to show up with icicles hanging from his face and be like, F -f 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 freeze. <laughs> he died in that frozen lake. Yep. Not even shot. He froze to death drowning it feels so horrible there's no reward there's no release no it's not the at exact all. opposite there are a lot of i think fairly obvious parallels to the tarantino western django most notably a german bounty hunter who wears a fur coat tarantino is a fan of corbucci django is named after the main character in corbucci's other great western django the actor who played django appears in django unchained let's talk about Welcome to the Basement Hall of Famer Klaus Kinski in this. I think he gave a very restrained performance. Yes, he's playing someone 
whose name is literally crazy, he plays a very sane, unfazable fellow. The Kinski craziness creeps through, because I don't think he could stop it from doing that. No. When he's in the jail, and he's just sort of making eyes in the corner, <laughs> just making weird faces, we look at the character who represents authority in this, the sheriff, and he's kind of a bumbling dope. Yeah. He tries to punch a guy in a jail cell, forgetting that there's bars. Do you see this as a commentary by the filmmaker on the law or authority figures or anything like that? Justice sometimes doesn't work. Sometimes justice is ineffective, and sometimes justice is effective, but still can't last. Going back to that whole idea of the indestructible hero, you know, eventually that guy's going to have a bad day, and he's going to go down. Yes. And we saw that day. You know one of my least favorite Western tropes? Shooting the gun out of the hand. How hard would that be? And how often would you really succeed? You'd be shooting people in, in the hands and the arms, and you'd be shooting magazines full of bullets, and they'd be exploding. It's just such a convenient, phony thing to do. And even in this movie, which is ultra-realistic, it happens all the time. How did you feel about the lead performance? He had to play a force. Yeah. As opposed to a real character. As for playing that force, I think he played it well. Kind of made me want to be a little more silent in my life. Yeah. Maybe I'll do some good things. They should have played with that more. The fact that if you're a silent person, people will keep talking to you. Hmm. Someone should make a silent gumshoe. Someone who just goes around, doesn't say anything, and then people will just... Spill the beans. Spill the beans, yeah. Final thoughts on The Great Silence. Alright, well that was silence. We watched it. <laughs> There's a place you can go where you don't have to do any talking at all. You just twiddle away on the keyboard, and that's our website. Welcome to TheBasementShow.com. Craig just wrote a new essay, which is up on there. You can check that out. And there's a PayPal donation button. You can donate a few dollars to support our show. Recent donors include... Brian, Joe, Merlin, Steve, Kyle, Philip, who says you guys are awesome. Jonathan, Nicole, Luke, Michael, Ann, Caroline. Please wish my former roommate and best friend Katrina a happy birthday, November 9th. I introduced her to Chad Vader in college, and we still enjoy talking and laughing together. Happy birthday, Katrina. Happy birthday. Hope it's a good one. Mora, Carrie, Sean, Auntie, who says, here's a small slice of love from Finland. Ah. Aaron, Cody, Tristan, Christopher. My wife Maria and I are celebrating our third wedding anniversary on Halloween. Watching your show is something we always look forward to together, and I think she would love it if you guys wished her a happy anniversary. Maria, I hope this anniversary is the best one yet. I hope that the next one's even better. And Kevin, who writes, Even while I'm deployed again, it feels like being at home watching movies with my buddies. Thanks, Kevin. Stay safe out there. Best of luck. Postcards. Our buddy T.A. Epley sent us one from Charlotte, North Carolina. Hey! Andrew, all the way from Gay Street in New York City. Josh and Same took a break from their honeymoon in Gatlinburg to send us this. Oh, there we go. Chris from atop the Mackinac Bridge. Mackinac Bridge. With the C in the end? Yeah. Like Arkansas. I don't know. What's Michigan? Sean and Sarah in Victoria, B.C. Ah. We got a very sweet letter here from Madeline. She's 15 years old. She sent us a little bit of scratch. Hey. And a very cute drawing of the two of us. Oh, look at that. So, thank you for that, Madeline. And now, it's time for Seen It. Michael U.S. Bonds asks... Have you seen The Horse's Mouth? Alec Guinness plays a Bukowski-like, misanthrope, drunken bum, artiste, genius, and it's amazing. Seen it. Seen it. And Alec Guinness wrote the screenplay for that. I imagine that an anti-hero misanthrope like that probably was a little hard to take in 1958. He's a little hard to take now. You know, he he's someone who's just barreling through life, just taking whatever he can get. He's knocking over whoever and whatever he can just so that he can... Pursue his art. Yeah, pursue his artistic needs. It is a stressful movie. What way is it stressful? There's that whole sequence when he holds up in the rich couple's apartment to paint the wall. He destroys the floor. You ruin these two people's lives, and who cares if they're rich? They didn't seem like bad people. Right, right. Yeah. Gully Jimson. Do you have anything to... Just that. Yeah. Becky and Brian from Maine would like to know if we have seen Rankin Bass's The Hobbit. Seen it. I think I saw it probably about once a year, uh, because they ran that on television about once a year throughout my childhood. I saw it once. One year. I happen to just re-watch this recently. Yes. It has a really bad reputation, but I have to say it's not that bad. They do a pretty good job of 
condensing the story down to 90 minutes or That's, however long it is. It's impossible to condense that movie down to one film, isn't it? <laughs> if it was possible, Peter Jackson would have done it. Well, he should have uh, taken a page out of Rankin and or Bass's book. So much of that is just branded on my brain. Mm-hmm. And so much of my first impressions of what fantasy and things like that look like and feel like come from that movie. It's got its faults. I mean, that song that they repeat over and over again is pretty terrible. The greatest adventure (laughs) is what lies ahead. Cody Machado asks, seen it? Tulane Blacktop? Seen it. Seen it. Monty Hellman was the director. I'm not sure he did a lot of feature films. He was very experimental. It's like this is the one he does for public consumption. It's a very strange film. Uh, In particular, the two lead performances, which he cast James Taylor and Dennis Wilson, Mm -hmm. two musicians, uh, in acting roles. And he really gets a performance out of them that you have never seen before and you will never see again. Yes. And I think it's a good result. They really don't have that much to do because they're supposed to be just these very dead kids without much you know desires or craving the opposite of warren oates in the film who's just this guy who's got a lot to prove Mm -hmm. and he's got a you know he's got big ambitions and and it's worth it just to watch warren oates as always whenever warren oates is on film james taylor in 1969 or whatever was hot look at that guy it's like you understand why your mom is so crazy about him or your grandmother i guess and at the same time his his performance is so deadpan Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and there's scenes where he's basically like he's stumbling over his lines. He can't get the lines out, but all of that informs the character. The one problem with the movie that was not intentional was the performance of the girl. I don't know her name. She didn't do much in her career. And the girl is the name of her character. Why are they all arguing over her? She's so boring. Hmm. They could have cast anyone in that and it would have been intriguing and watchable. And it's like, yes, this is a reason to drive. Maddie McClare writes, Have you guys seen Cronenberg's The Fly? Seen it. Seen it. Of Cronenberg's 70s and 80s output, this is the one that has the most heart and humanity to it because you see someone who's losing their humanity, you really feel that loss and the effect that loss has on the people around him. A lot of people thought this was uh, Cronenberg selling out because he did a movie for Hollywood. If this is Cronenberg selling out, Keep doing it. (laughs) It is relentlessly disgusting and disturbing, just how you want it to be, but it has a plot that makes sense. It's not, you're not wondering what the hell a Videodrome is. You don't have some lunk-headed actor playing the scanner you're supposed to love. Everything's in place. And it's a remake that's better than the original. Yes, it can be done. Gina Davis is great in that movie, and Jeff Goldblum. He finally gets to be sexy. He had been playing a nerd for, like, the previous five years, and then he, like, takes off... And in the first half of that movie. Yeah, and then he takes off his shirt, and you're like, oh, that nerd's (laughs) been working out, I guess. He certainly gets not sexy during the second half of the movie. True. And if you ever want to see how Brundlefly eats, (laughs) go no farther than the fly. That's seen it. And that's our show. We watched The Great Silence. Craig has inflicted it upon us all. We watched it, and we were the only ones who lived to tell the tale. November continues next time, and this time I'll be choosing the glaring omission. Yeah? But you'd like to know what it's going to be. Well, it can't be anything that's Italian, and it can't be a spaghetti western. Damn it. (laughs) Good night. Kinski. Oh, Pauline... We're collecting food for those poor folk who've been hiding up in the mountains. They never were bandits. What do you got to offer? I'll go see. Kidney beans, I'll never eat those. Wax beans, those are just nasty. Uh, pie filling. Give, give them the pie filling. I keep eating and eating, and still I'm miserable.